four parts of the talk. The first part, I'm going to review some common variants of lifting. It's linear, quadratic, placebo. So what does lifting do? It takes a linear system. In this case, A is over the integers or rational numbers. And we extend out the solution. A inverse B is our system solution. We get a series expansion of it. Or if B is the identity matrix, then exactly we're computing the actual entire inverse of A. So that's, the, that's what motivated the original work on lifting over the last 20, 30 years. Guess what? E. B could be a vector for solving a linear system. So I'll give some explicit examples. This is what motivated the work on lifting the last 30 years. But there's also other applications. And one of these is this concept of a residue. As I've shown here, it's crazy. It's a little bit strange. I've got the A inverse on the left and the right. So we'll see some explicit examples of this. And hopefully I can convince you that this object, by order residue R, is very important. It has many applications. So we'll see a couple today in this talk. And the third part, I'll explain a new algorithm for computing this high order residue R. Kind of a combination of the different lifting strategies. And I'll give a report on the implementation at the end. So first I want to review some history, some variants of lifting that have been developed over the years. We'll look at linear lifting, quadratic, and high order. Those are the three I'm going to cover today. I'm going to have a very high level here. I'm going to restrict myself to a single slide cover each of these algorithms. But we will drill down a little bit later on and look at the code for And I just want to point out the work is still going on. All of these algorithms compute basically the same thing. And there's a paper coming out at this year's ISAC where they give a relaxed version of quadratic lifting. That's based on Van der Hoven's lazy, lazy arithmetic. So that's an interesting paper. I won't talk about that here, I just wanted to mention that. So at the top level, what does lifting do? Or let's recall about linear systems. We have a non-singular matrix A, integer matrix, and we invert it, and we get this big inverse filled with large rational numbers. So really, A, we should be considering the entries come from the field of rational numbers. So we invert it, we can only invert it over the field of rational numbers for general matrix A. Fair enough, we don't like rational numbers so much, then we have to do GCDs, put them in lowest common terms. So Let's write the rational number. Let's expand it out as a periodic expansion. In this case, our P is 97. We can always do that, provided that 97 is relatively prime to the denominator. And there it is in this case. So I can expand it out. It's an infinite periodic expansion. I can truncate it at some point. And so I get this equivalent representation. It's easy to go back and forth. Go from here. This is the radix conversion. I get the periodic expansion. If I have a periodic expansion that I have precision, I can go back. That's rational number reconstruction. So we're going to work with this representation here. That's what lifting works with that representation. So what does lifting do for us? Given an integer matrix and a vector b, we can compute these different things. I can solve linear system. I can compute a inverse b. That's really what we want. We want a linear combination of the columns of the inverse. Or we can actually compute the entire inverse itself. That's something we almost never want to do, because look how big it is n times as much space to write down as the input. If the dimension is 8,000, we can never store the thing on the computer. So that's why I say, or we can get the interesting representations of the inverse. So we can get sparse, straight line formulas that are useful and don't require much more space to write down than A itself. And the third thing we can do is compute one of these higher order residues. That's this object R in this equation here. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on the third application the high order residue. So here's the idea of lifting, given a non-singular matrix. So modulus, usually we choose about the same size as entries in A. And in this example here, given the example of linear system solving, the vector B, what does lifting do? It computes the E out of the expansion of the solution vector. And of course, it doesn't start with the solution vector and do a radius conversion on each of the rational numbers. It works directly with a and B, and somehow computes these coefficients in the PIP expansion. B0, B1 times 97, B2 times 97 squared. So each PI is going to be reduced modulo 97. And if we have enough precision, we have enough coefficients, then we can go back and actually reconstruct the rational solution vector here. But lifting is the process of recovering these coefficients, the PIs. So let's look at the three different variations of lifting. Like I say, I tried to limit myself to a single slide for each. So here's linear lifting. 
first presented in literature about 30 years ago. And we divide the computation into two parts. There's a pre-computation. We first compute the first coefficient C0 of the periodic expansion of A inverse. So what is that? We just take A, reduce it modulo P, and compute the inverse of A modulo P. That's what C0 is. So it's strictly a matrix operation. It's equivalent to a matrix multiplication. And now we do a loop. Now we iterate. We compute at stage one. We take C0 times B. That gives us B0, the solution of the linear system modulo P. Now lifting us, just us the matrix vector products, and from B0, it can get, get B1. It's a very iterative process. Now no more matrix multiplication, just matrix vector products. We got B1, we get B2, we get B2, it lifts up to B3. So it lifts in an iterative fashion. So we do five iterations, we don't get very far. So we have to, this process has to be one. It's a linear convergence. This is linear lifting. It's not bad though, it's only a matrix vector product. That's n squared. If we do n of them, that's n cubed. Typically we want to go out to n. And that's equivalent to the phase one, which is an n cubed operation, matrix multiplication. That's linear lifting. What about quadratic lifting? Quadratic lifting is only useful to get the expansion of the inverse itself. And so we want to compute C0, C1, C2. Initialization is exactly the same. In fact, linear quadratic lifting are exactly the same algorithm. The only difference in quadratic lifting is we're increasing the precision at each stage. So we get C0. So I've separated it out because it is a bit of a different operation. It's a matrix inverse. And now we enter the loop. And now we strictly do matrix multiplications. So from C0, we use the precision we have so far, and we get C1. So this iteration one will be exactly the same as linear lift. But now we increase the precision. Now we double the precision. We use all of what we've computed so far, C0, C1, and we use that to get the next two coefficients, C2 and C3. Now we have four coefficients. We use all four of them to get the next four. So the cost of what's the increase here as the loop goes up. The most expensive one is kind of at the end. We're doing a matrix multiplication, but the precision has increased up to 32 in this example. So we have this nice quadratic convergence here, but it seems to be only applicable for the inverse expansion itself, because we want to use C0, C1, C2, C3 to get the next part. So somehow we like to combine these two. We like to incorporate matrix multiplication into the linear lifting, and this is what higher lifting does. So this presented this at ISAC around 10 years ago. So here we really want to compute a linear system, A inverse B. But somehow we want to have the matrix multiplication, like quadratic lifting provide. And here's the idea. So the initialization, we don't just compute C0. We compute certain coefficients of the inverse expansion. From C0, we can get C2. We can actually skip over C1. We can avoid its computation. From C2, we can jump up to C4. From C4, we can jump up to C8. So we avoid, we avoid the computation of the coefficients in between. And that's going to save a lot of time. So we have this doubling. If we go up to n log of n, so we have log of n matrix multiplications in the initialization phase. This is a variant of quadratic lifting, but it avoids computing most of the coefficients. This is useful because now we compute b0 using c0. And the next stage, we compute b16 using c16. And now we have something nice. Now we have two linear systems. Instead of one linear system, solve up to precision 32, we have two linear systems to solve up to precision 16. And the nice thing is to solve both of them, we could use linear lifting to go on here. Linear lifting, we're not going to do that. We're going to apply the idea recursively. We're going to use C8 now. C8 is the same matrix that we're going to apply to both of these and to jump them up and compute B of 8 and B of 24. So now we have four systems of quarter to precision to solve. So we have four matrix vector products, essentially. We're not going to do them one by one. We're going to put those four vectors together in a single matrix. So we have an n by 4 matrix. And we do a single matrix times n by 4. So if we use level 2 loss, that's actually not much more expensive than a single matrix vector product. Because most of the effort is below the matrix A and the cash. And at the very end, you see we're incorporating matrix multiplication. Now we do a single matrix times an n by n over 2 matrix, for example. And we get all of the, we fill in all of the, all of the VIs. 
So that's how we incorporate matrix multiplication into lifting. So that's all I want to say at this level about the lifting. We'll look at the algorithms in a little bit. Now I'll go to part two and talk about the this high order residue. So here I've written this equation, which has the residue R in it. So let's look at what this is. So I've given a scalar example here, y six seven, and these equations they hold over the rational numbers. There's no periodics or anything here. These are just equations over the rational numbers. So the inverse of five six seven, I can compute its inverse modulo ten to the five, for example. Here my modulo is ten to the five. I get minus one two eight seven in the symmetric range if I want. And so I've expressed the inverse of five six seven. I have this integer part. But then there's also some fractional part, and that's given by 567 inverse times the residue at the working precision, and that was 10 to the 5. So I can do this for any precision that I want. Here in the next example, 10 to the 10. So I have the inverse modulo 10 to the 10. And the remaining part, there must be a unique residue, in this case it's minus 89. So what I want to show here is that the residue is always small. Provided I have my integer part, it's provided it's equal to. 5, 6, 7, modulo 10 to the 20, that residue is always going to be small. So I've got an extreme example here, 10 to the power, 10 to the power 7. So we can compute that and try to enable it says, oh, the object's too large, I can't print it out. It'll take much longer to print out on the screen than it is computed. But that's fine, you can compute it, and the residue is still small. It's always small. In fact, the size of the residue is going to be about the same as the size of A itself. So let's look at the matrix example. We have the same equation. And now let's first look at why it's small. So if I multiply the last equation by 5, 6, 7, I'm going to change that to a 1. This is the inverse of 5, 6, 7, modulo 10 to the power 10 to the 7. So it's going to be equal to 1, except for it's not quite the inverse. It's only the inverse modulo 10 to the power 10 to the power 7. So I'm going to have some, some stuff left over. And that's exactly what the residue is. The residue is what fixes that up. So it's the, it's the negative of the stuff that's left over. This shows that the residue is always going to be small. It's only going to be proportional to the size. The overflow is going to be proportional to the size of A itself. So now let's go on to look at the matrix example. So we've seen higher lifting. Higher lifting, this variant of quadratic lifting, we can jump over most of these coefficients, the CIs. So we can go out to a very high order, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. We get out there very quickly. And it also computes the residue which is nice. So here's an example. The matrix A, and the inverse looks like this. And so I can express matrix A as a large integral part. I've jumped out very high here at the 97th power, 1024. And the residue is what's left over. It kind of captures the fractional part of A. The leftover part is A inverse R. And that's the interesting object. We're going to try and convince you now in a couple slides why we care about that object, why that's so interesting. So here's the first application. One property that special matrices have is that they're unimodular. If I have an integer matrix and the determinant is plus or minus one, I can invert that matrix. And I know that the inverse is also going to be an integer matrix. So they have very special matrices. They're invertible over the integers. And that's only if the matrix has a determinant plus or minus one. So we want to determine that. Given some matrix, is it unimodular? So the observation is, if I have an integer matrix and I take a periodic expansion, eventually that expansion must terminate. It's not going to be infinite periodic expansion. Only the rational numbers have infinite periodic expansions. Integers don't. So if I go high enough and I check out the residue, I just have to look, is that residue zero or not? If it's zero, I can say it's matrix. It's unimodular. If it's not, I say no, it's not unimodular. So here's the example. 8,000 by 8,000 matrix. So we can actually compute this now. Quite expensive to actually compute the determinant. So we want to we want to guarantee is it unimodular or not? We want to certify the answer. We don't just want to compute the determinant module random prime. That'll determine the high probability it's unimodular or not. We want to certify that it's correct. So here's how we do it. We get this residue R. So if it is unimodular, I know there's going to be integer entries inside, but they're going to be huge. As mentioned, 8,000, two decimal digits inside. There's going to be more than 16,000 decimal digits in the inverse. So I get this residue, I jump out very high. Of course, I completely avoid the computation of this term here, but I do get the R. And then I look, 
if the R is zero, that equation holds, so I have A inverse equal to this integer matrix. Well, obviously, A inverse is an inter integer matrix. I can say T and modulus. And the opposite is also true. If R is not zero here, then I can report it's not E to So we can also show that's the case. So I just have to compute R, see if, see if it's zero or not. So I can answer, we can answer this question now for matrices of this size. And because of this quadratic convergence, we only have about 14 matrix multiplications. So I wrap the big hole around, it's probably a factor of two there. Let's look at another application. This is kind of a naive application. We compute this object, and I just want to see if it's zero or not. In fact, it contains a lot more information than that. Let's look at the same example again, the two by two example. And A and A inverse. And I want you to think of this as being a dimension 8,000. Here it's two by two, so it fits on the slide. And A inverse has kind of a not nice property. It's very ill conditioned. The numerators are much larger than the denominator. So even if A had dimension 8,000, I could have A inverse having a denominator 644. These common multiple denominator could be 644, but the numerators, they could have 16,000 decimal digits in them. So I cannot work with A inverse. However, I can compute this high order residue R. It's going to have about the same size entries as A. So in this case, I've gone up very high. I stepped over all the numerator. The residue is going to have about the same size entries as A. And look at what effect R has on A inverse. If I multiply, both multiply A inverse by R, it has the effect of lattice reduction. It reduces the numerators and makes them smaller than the denominator. So it's going to make A inverse into a proper matrix fraction. So it does lattice reduction for us. And in general, it's going to be an almost proper matrix fraction. So this is a very nice effect. And why is it nice? It's because A inverse R contains all of the same information as A inverse. So if I want to ask questions about the determinant of A, Smith form, Kirby form, or do the lattice reduction, I can work with A inverse R instead of working with A inverse. Let me give a quick example of lattice reduction here. So A inverse is that. I don't want to compute A inverse. Instead, I compute a higher order residue. And if I compute A inverse R now, I get a proper matrix fraction. So I can save a lot of time by forgetting about these big numerators. Now say I want to compute a reduced basis of A. I want to do lattice reduction. So instead of working with A itself, I can work with A inverse R. I can scale up the denominator and form this knapsack class here. And that's exactly what the algorithm from Van Hoy and Dobison wants, is a knapsack type lattice. So if I reduce this now, I get out a reduced basis for A itself. So this is just one application. So this is also used for polynomial matrices, to get lattice reduction for polynomial matrices. That's nice, like they did in 2003. So I hope I've motivated the R if I want to compute it. So next, I want to give the algorithm for computing R, a new algorithm to get this high order residue. So we're quickly we call linear lifting. But now on this slide, I'm doing linear lifting to compute the actual inverse expansion itself. I get C0, one matrix inversion modulo P. And now I get C0, I get C1, I get C2, I get the coefficients in succession. And here's the algorithm. Normally, I don't show code on the slides, but in this talk, it's actually important to look at the actual code. So at the start of iteration, we have the first i coefficients, and we have r i the residue. What does the loop do? It only has to work with r of i. So we only need c of 0 and r of i. All the previous coefficients we computed, they don't come into the equation. They're not used in the loop. So I compute c of i from, the, from r of i, but I update, I get the next residue. From the previous residue and the coefficient I just computed. So the linear lifting is only ever working at the leading part of this here. You get the next C of i and you get R of i plus 1. And the loop just iterates. Let's look at quadratic lifting. And we're going to see it's exactly the same, except we increase the precision each time through the loop. So it's a similar picture here, except that we replace i by 2 to the i. And for simplicity, I just call that b. b is going to be updated throughout the loop. So we have the inverse up to precision through the i. And each iteration of the loop is going to double the precision. So here again, the next residue just computed from the current b. And I update the precision of the inverse by using the previous b and the r that I just computed. So one thing we'd like to do is simplify this loop even more. So one idea for doing that is 
do some loop unrolling or software pipeline or something, but the big, big problem here is the REM operation. That really messes things up. If we just have automatic operations, it's much easier to do some simplifications. But the REM, it's not a standard operation. It's got a division with remainder. We don't like that at all. But first, let's take a look at an example of how this algorithm works, what it's computing. So here I get the example in terms of this residue equation. So we want to compute the inverse of 777 using quadratic lifting. So the inverse of 777 modulo 10 is 3, and I have plus the extra part, the remaining part. The inverse modulo 10 squared is 13, and 77 inverse times the residue minus 101. And modulo 10 to 4, so it's got to have four decimal digits, modulo 10 to 8, that's the inverse. And so everything is nice, we have this doubling and precision of B each time, and the residue always stays small. So actually my goal is to compute the residue, but I'd like to somehow avoid the computation of B entirely. And I'm going to do that by simplifying that code. The rem gets in the way. Let's just take the rem out. This is the idea, kind of a great idea. Let's just take the rem out and see what happens. Maybe it produces garbage. Here's exactly the same algorithm. I just took the rem away. So let's see what happens. Start off. The initialization, the loop hasn't happened yet, so I get the same answer. The inverse modulo 10 is 3. But now it's going to do the B update without the rem operation. Remarkably, the equation still holds. So lifting works with error. The error is still in fact the mathematical correctness of the lifting. But this is supposed to be the inverse of 777 modulo 10, which should really have 10 squared, which should have two digits, but it's got four. So there's some extra garbage in there. That's the problem. And let's look what happened. There's extra garbage here. The residue is no longer about the size of the A. It's grown to accommodate for that extra garbage. This equation has to hold, of course. Let's try it again. This is supposed to be the inverse modulo 10 to the 4, but we have way too many digits in there. And that's accounted for. The residue is also wrong. And that's not what we want. We want the residue to have the same size as it is today. And so this quickly gets out of hand. But nonetheless, let's take a look at this code. Let's try and simplify it. And that's what we did. And now we can simplify it. So I won't show the details here. So look at R. I can plug the equation for B into the one for R. Except the equation for B depends on the new R that was just computed. So there's some work to do here. But we can simplify it down. And lo and behold, we have this very simple code that we get at the end. So once we compute one residue, you get the future residues, you just have to keep squaring. It's that simple. So the R is computed by the optimized version is exactly the same as the residue is computed by the original one. But unfortunately, it's, it's not good. So we get the straight line formula for the inverse. A inverse, it converges, this infinite formula converges to the periodic inverse of A. Here's an example, 7, 7 inverse. Here's R, R squared, R fourth. I get this expression. It is congruent to the inverse module of 10 to 8. I did three steps of lifting, so 2 to the power of 3 is 8. However, there's a large overflow. The actual inverse module of 10 to 8 is this. That expression gives me that number, which is correct. Congruent module of 10 to 8, but it's way too big. So how do we alleviate this expression as well? This is the idea of double plus one lifting. So mathematically, loop invariants are a little bit different here. So this is the optimized version, the doubling precision each time, or the residue. What we're going to do is we're going to do one quadratic lifting step, and then we're going to do one linear lifting. And for the linear lifting, the effect that's going to have is going to step over the error, and there we do a REM operation to make sure that we don't introduce any additional error. So we do one quadratic lifting and one linear lifting step. Now we call this double plus one lift. So note the invariant is a little bit different. There in the position is 2 the i minus 1, the i minus 1 is the exponent. Here 2 the i minus 1, and here the minus 1 is not the equal to y. That's because we're doing a doubling, then plus one, doubling, plus one. So let's look at an explicit example. Five, six, seven, inverse, that's our initialization. Now we do a quadratic lifting step. So from 1,000 to 1,000 squared. And here we have the problem creeping up. It is 3025, it's kind of grown in size, that residue's grown. But now we do one linear lifting step. We go from position two to three, and now we bring it back down to size again. Here again, we go from 3 to 6, one quadratic lifting step, we'll up a little bit, but then we do one linear lifting step, and we bring it back down to size. So we have to do a bit of numerical analysis here. How big does the lifting modules have to be 
in order to have the step over the air, that's not difficult to do. So in major cities, a little bit more work to do there, but we did that analysis. It doesn't have to be much larger than the entries in the ASL. So some final comments. Here's some comments on the implementation of the algorithm. And to do efficient linear algebra, we know we want to reduce everything to level three blocks. And so that's what we did. And to do that, the lifting modulus p, it might have to be larger than what fits into a single word size. And here our word size, we're using blocks, it's going to have to fit into a double. So we have this 2 times n minus 1, 2 to 53. Our primes that we're using, they have to be smaller than that. So we can do the matrix multiplications using floating point arithmetic, using the loss library. And so we might have to use a lifting basis. Our lifting moduli might actually have to be the product of various primes, and that all works. So here's a brief outline. First, we compute the initial residue in the P basis. Then we compute this object M in the P basis. Then we have to use basis extension to transform it to a different basis. And why do we want to do that? Because the linear lifting step is going to want to multiply by P inverse. So we can't do that if we're working modulo P. So we have to go to a different basis. We can do that multiplication then in the Q basis. And we go back and forth between these bases. So the bulk of the work, the heavy lifting is all done by level 3 plus. So final slide with some timings. So the timings, maybe not so compelling because we can't compare against anything. I don't know of another implementation that could use higher residues. But here's the timings nonetheless. So for an 8,000 matrix, this is the size of entries to bit, or the number of decimal digits in the entries of A. So it's a random matrix, the single decimal digit entries. It takes about 11 hours. And it also works for large entries, matrix code, 100 decimal digit entries. Much 2000, it's about 1.2 hours. So one point of comparison is how long does it take to solve a linear system involving such a matrix? We have 2,000 under decimal digit entries. So we can do that using the inner matrix library, solve a single linear system A inverse B, and it takes about 1.3 hours. And here we're compute the entire higher residue of 1.2. So we're pretty happy with that. It's fairly fast. And we also try to incorporate some parallelism. Because we are using a lifting basis, each one of those matrix multiplications, modulo the different PIs, that can be done in parallel. So if we do that, on this final example here, I mentioned 2000, we can do it in about 18 minutes. And how so we ought to... Sorry, how many cores? How many cores? I think that machine has hundreds of cores. I think it's using at most 19 for this example. So the limit of the parallelism here is the lifting basis. When we do a matrix multiplication, we have to do it in parallel for all these different primes. And so that kind of limits the parallelism. So another thing we could try is use a threaded version of level 3 loss. And that should bring the time down here. This is not using the threaded version of loss. Parallelism here is only to do the matrix multiplications themselves in parallel. So that's it. Are there still questions? No questions? Then let's say come again. Question would say.